Hello and welcome uh, to our mining industry review where we'll be discussing the current project spending outlook based on what's in play for this year, uh, but more importantly what potential planned spending levels are looking like uh, moving into next year, into that all-important 2021. Uh, my name is Shaheen Chahan and I'm going to be one of your presenters today. Uh, to help me along with our discussion, I'm delighted to be joined by Joe Gavreau. Uh, Joe is our Vice President of Global Metals and Minerals Research. Uh, and he'll, he's going to be presenting what the current spending outlook uh, is shaping up to be, and will obviously be sharing some of his observations around where and how spending may trade, uh, may trend over the short term. Um, we'll also be having, and building in towards the end of the presentation, uh, a short Q&A at the end of the, the, the formal, uh, formal session. So uh, before we get started and jump into the, uh, the formal discussion, I would like to say a very big thank you to today's webinar sponsors. We have Hexagon PPM. Hexagon is the world's leading provider of enterprise engineering design software and project control solutions and their technology and solutions help transform uh, unstructured information into smart digital assets, really enabling their clients to better visualize, build and manage structures and facilities to ensure safe and efficient operations of plants and facilities. So many thanks guys for your support today on the webinar. Now, okay, to let's get started. And, and as those of you who sit on these webinars uh, are familiar, uh, I, like, I do like to start with a top line look at the current state of global growth. Uh, and this is particularly pertinent, I think, for this webinar due to the very close alignment the mining sector has with overall GDP. Now, we came into the start of the year on the expectation uh, of improved economic growth, and that was really coming back off the back of uh, a 2019 that had seen trade disputes hem back and stifle the growth momentum that was generated back in 2017. Now, at the start of the year, the IMF was projecting uh, growth of about 3 minus 3.4% globally, with most markets showing improvement on 2019. This was then subsequently adjusted downwards in April by the IMF, uh, and that was at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, the hopes of an improvement during the latter part of this year, so that's during Q3 and moving into Q4, is now not looking like it will materialize as was previously projected. And so when the IMF recalibrated their growth forecasts, um, in June, they made further adjustments. As we can see, those adjustments have been down. Um, many of the major developed markets now have shown further contraction, as we can see, uh, and many of those key Asian growth markets that we were really relying on it to some degree are now being further impacted as we enter into what could now be seen uh, as, a, as a COVID second wave. Now, there is a still a degree of, a degree of optimism uh, coming into next year that could point to some degree of inflection. Uh, so we see some growth. The IMF had previously projected 2021 GDP to grow to around 5.8%, as you can see, but this has also actually been trimmed down only slightly so far by 0.4%. So I think really a lot rests on how governments, as well as corporates, and also the consumer continues and starts to respond and adapt to what was initially seen uh, at the beginning of the year as a short-term impediment, but now COVID being still being around could actually be more of an extended new norm. Now, if we look at the sort of the impact that has made, um, what that's made uh, to metals prices, what we've actually seen is uh, the, the, we can see that those trend very closely and, and are very closely aligned to overall GDP. Now, what we've seen is precious metals tend to outperform base metals on the whole during slumps or recessionary periods. Uh, and, and that's really down to gold and its status as a, uh, as a safe haven asset. Now, coming into the start of the year, as I said, there was that expectation that there would be more rebalancing in supply and demand. Uh, Joe's going to be touching on that in, in, 
particular detail, certainly when we look at some of those key commodities. Uh, and that sort of rebalancing that we were expecting at the start of the year was due to uh, historically a number of previous years uh, seeing a major pullback in CapEx going forward. Uh, we, 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 we've seen a big retrenchment back from a lot of that CapEx going into grassroot mines, and this led to a view that the rate of new uh, mining production coming online was not expected really to keep pace with the rate of demand growth pickup that was expected long term. And this in turn was leading many analysts to expect an actual supply deficit over the next couple of years. Uh, copper, copper being one of those uh, one of those key commodities that was expected to be in, in slightly tighter supply. Now, as with all things, COVID has obviously dampened demand for this year, and so we are seeing a divergence, as you can see on the chart to the right, between uh, precious metals and base metals. And we see that you know the major short-term demand destruction from key consumer sectors such as manufacturing, automotive, and civil construction is creating that divergence. So we see you know, uh, investors flocking towards gold, but the, the, the true consumers of those base metals are now continuing to fall away, and that's why we're seeing that divergent pattern. Now, if we look at uh, and bring you into the discussion, Joe, uh, what would be interesting to see is whilst we've seen the, the breaks being put on metals demand this year, have we actually seen any disruption from COVID uh, at the mine site, uh, which is disruptive supply? Oh yeah, and, and thanks Shaheen. Um, we talked at our mid-year update, we talked about how the, we're in a new paradigm with COVID-19 effectively putting the brakes on the global economy impacting both demand and supply of mine commodities and slowing capital spending. Um, this continues as global GDP growth, as you mentioned, has now been downgraded to uh, contract 4.9% in 2020. Um, now in August, we're in our seventh month of COVID-related demand and supply disruptions as the number of cases continues to rise in certain hotspots and wanes in others. Uh, miners have tapered production to deal with the muted demand, and demand is slowly returning for many commodities, including iron ore and copper. Um, the first wave of mines placed on care and maintenance occurred during the first and second quarters of this year uh, due to government lockdowns and other safety precautions. And you can see those uh, shutdowns of what's still shut down today uh, by sector and commodity here. Now, some of these mines have reopened and in some cases even closed again due to resurgence in cases, and other mines have been shuttered or have extended uh, shutterings based on safety or for economic reasons. Um, at the end of May, there were 597 plants shuttered due to COVID. Uh, this includes mines, uh, processing plants, smelters, and other downstream metals and minerals plants. Now, that number has now been reduced by about half to 306 um, currently shuttered. Uh, so many mines uh, not impacted directly by COVID are operating at reduced capacity in response to um, the economic slowdown. And we see this continuing into next year. So now, Joe, um, sorry Joe. Yeah, I was just so going to say we're going to trans. Go ahead, Shane. So, so um, just picking up on that theme, as mine operators have continued to shutter their production, uh, I can, you know, only assume that this has had the, you know, kind of reciprocal effect of impacting project activity, right? Uh, whether those projects are already under construction. Now, I know that that's something that you guys have been tracking in earnest, uh, but also more importantly, I think, for the forward-looking picture, what has the impact? been on planned spending? Yeah, a good point. We're currently tracking 1,400 projects that have been delayed or impacted in some way due to COVID. Um, this totals about 184 billion worldwide. Uh, about a third of these projects are in the approval or construction stages and the other two thirds are in planning. Uh, since March 1st, we've surveyed 
almost 19,000 projects in the metals and minerals industry of the total 28,000 that we have in the platform. And of that number, 7.4% of the projects representing 15% of the value have been impacted in some way by the pandemic. Now we're finding most of these projects are being delayed anywhere from three months to a year with a lot of project development being pushed into next year. Uh, there have been some cancellations, but most projects are just being delayed. Um, capital spending continues at a reduced, reduced rates, at least for this year, and we see it uh, picking up next year. Um, some important jurisdictions, uh, such as uh, Australia and African countries, have not been as hard hit by the pandemic yet. Uh, as some countries in Latin America, for example. So, Joe, taking the impact that we've seen on spending and bringing that down a level and take, taking a quick look at you know, grassroots development, are you bringing new minds online? Uh, now, we've seen a number, as I've said earlier, we've seen a number of years of falling numbers of new minds coming into operation. Do you think that this is going to be a typical trend that will be extended out over the long term? And if it is, why is that happening? Yeah, we've definitely seen a down downtrend in new mines coming online since the, the mining boom, uh, which peaked in 2014. Um, 2020 will mark the lowest number of new mines coming online uh, since we've been tracking this uh, statistic. There are many reasons for this, uh, including difficulty in permitting new mines. Uh, mining firms are looking more t at life extensions of existing assets um, or expanding underground at existing assets rather than building new mines, which tend to be more expensive and, and difficult to permit. Uh, there was also a significant capital outlay for new mines built during the mining boom, as I mentioned. and um, Companies have been concentrating on optimizing production from those assets. Um, new mines uh, are more mechanized and becoming more out automated as companies look to improve safety, reduce labor costs, conserve energy, and decarbonize. This is reflected in the growing use of autonomous uh, mining equipment and electric uh, fuel cell and battery operated mining fleets getting away from diesel usage. Uh, Fortescue Metals, for example, in Australia is looking at, um, well, they just recently signed a contract with Hyzon Motors, which is a U.S.-based company to supply hydrogen fuel cells uh, coaches at its uh, one of its mines in Western Australia. Uh, many mines are installing captive power plants uh, or outsourcing to build, own, operate companies to supply power. Uh, we're tracking about 180 projects uh, totaling 36 billion for power generation projects at mines and uh, a lot of those are renewable uh, solar or wind and we're expecting an uptick in mine startups next year based on the number of mines currently under construction and uh, those delayed from 2020 due to covid issues okay. now joe flipping the box around a little bit and let's take a look at where we're going to expect to see that capex coming from, and this is just a, a breakdown of the, uh, you know, the, the top mining companies uh, and looking at their sort of aggregate budgets over a historical period, period but more importantly, um, what they're up, obviously looking to, to, to commit to going forward. Now, um, these players themselves are responsible pretty much for the lion's share of overall in, industry investment, if I'm if I'm not wrong. What levels of spending commitment? can we expect to see certainly over the next couple of years from these major players? Yeah, I think it's important to look at the major mining firms because it's a good bellwether of spending for the entire industry. So on the left, we have the original, uh, what was planned prior to COVID for the top six uh, mining companies. And you can see a steady increase since the bottom of the market in 2017 which uh, has now peaked uh, last year at $25.9 billion. Uh, originally, these six firms were planning a 12% increase in CapEx this year, as we reported uh, during our webinar in March. 
COVID put a speed bump on those uh, plans. And uh, on the right, I've added the 2020 after COVID numbers to this slide so that you can compare the original uh, forecast to how it stands now. All of these companies have reevaluated capital expenditures and have reduced CapEx uh, combined 13% lower than originally planned and 3% less than last year. Um, one company uh, since our last uh, webinar, uh, BHP Billiton actually revised its CapEx up a billion dollars this year and half billion next. Uh, most of these firms are saying they're just deferring expenditures until next year. If that plays out, then we could see a nice rebound. But it's a fluid situation, and uh, firms continue to reevaluate based on market conditions. Um, right now, these firms are focusing on conserving cash for the most part and getting operations that have been placed on care and maintenance back online as country restrictions are lifted. Uh, my thinking is that spending for 2021 will fall into the range represented here at uh, about 14% growth next year, which is good news, I think. Yeah, I agree with that, Joe. So, uh, Joe, let's get into, I guess, the guts of what we're going to be talking about today, and that's the, the outlook for 2020, or right, we're partway through that already, but also, more importantly, what does 2021 look like? Uh, and now this is just a top line view of everything that's active at the moment. So this is the total current pipeline of project activity. And we've seen, um, I guess we've, we've obviously seen some deterioration in project realization or, or have we, uh, have we seen projects coming from the engineering stage into the, into the construction stage or, or start uh, or kick off? Has that deteriorated? And also what does the forward planned pipeline of spending look like? So those projects still at the planning and engineering stage, is that expanded or is that contracted? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of activity still going on. I think the long-term drivers of project spending um, are still intact. So you have population growth, urbanization, electrification, and decarbonization. These are all driving companies to spend, to spend money on uh, commodity supply. Um, so this uh, currently, it just shows all active projects that we're tracking and breaks down by project timing. Uh, we have $1.16 trillion worth of projects currently. On the left, you can see that there's 2,000 of those projects are under construction, representing about $197 billion. Um, the number of projects is down a bit compared to last year, but the TIV is up. And I think this is, has a lot to do with uh, some of these uh, projects having extended construction timelines uh, due to the pandemic. Um, on the right, we have all active projects in the planning and engineering stages, which represents about 964 billion. And this is up from last year's numbers as well. So Joe, before we move off this slide, I just want to pick up on one, one comment you made because in previous webinars, we've always seen the number of projects go up, uh, but the TIVs goes down, which is always a great uh, reflection of what we were seeing on the ground, which was lots of smaller implant CapEx projects, less big grassroots. Are you saying now that we're, we, we're starting to see a shift in that or, or what, what type of projects do you think are, are causing the higher tier TIV but lower numbers? Yeah, I definitely think that some of these projects are larger capa larger TIV projects um, that we're looking at in, in that time period. Okay. Right, this is uh, just a quick visualization, really just to, to sort of highlight what we're going to be talking about in more detail. So anything there, uh, you know, highlighted in yellow um, are going to be the, the, the markets or the commodities that we're going to be talking about in a bit more of a deep, deep dive. So of that 1.16 trillion that Joe talked about that's still active at various stages of development, around 25% of what we're going to discuss today uh, that is scheduled to kick off um, is represented by that 400 billion. Uh, so it's about 25% of that, that 1.16. 
Now, in the interest of time, we're not going to cover all of the geographies. Uh, so, as I said, anything in yellow uh, is what we're going to be looking at. Uh, the three market regions that uh, we will focus on account for about 38% of that 400 billion. Um, and the four commodities there on the right uh, will cover around almost 70% of that total 400 billion. So that's really just the, the, the scene setter for us uh, to now move you, Joe, into the first uh, market region being North America. Now, um, my first question here really is, is how has the market fared overall? Um, and what are certainly what are some of the, I guess, go to markets that folks should be paying attention to in North America? Yeah, our uh, North American project spending index is showing a 7.8% decline for project spending this year. Um, when compared to last year. So the major drivers of spending include demand for commodities into automotive, aerospace, and construction industries. And both the auto and aerospace have been hit hard this year due to decreasing demand brought about by the pan pandemic. In the case of the airline industry, uh, shutdowns and grounding problems uh, with, the, with the new Boeing 737 is also playing uh, into demand. Um, auto manufacturing is down significantly this year due to the pandemic. Uh, the U.S. auto industry produced about 16.8 million vehicles last year and is expected to produce around 12.6 million this year, um, or at least that's the pace they're at right now. Uh, 2021 should increase significantly, but probably not up to pre-COVID production. Now, all of this is going to have an impact on upstream demand for metals. Um, when you look at the top markets, potash, phosphate, and fertilizer projects are maybe surprisingly at the top, uh, representing about 25% of the activity in the U.S. and Canada. And these are mainly, we're tracking about 35 projects in this category, mainly in Canada. And there's a couple of very large projects, um, the Janssen, for example, which is wrapping up uh, shaft construction right now, and they're waiting till the middle of next year for a, a decision on, on whether or not they're going to finish construction or delay it. Uh, there's also some big uh, soda ash mining projects in Wyoming by a company named Center that we're watching closely. Um, uranium mining has uh, slowed to a trickle in the U.S., with uh, most of ban being met by imports from Canada. Uh, COVID idling of uh, Cameco um, operations in Canada and also Gas Adaprom in Kazakhstan has boosted prices. Um, these operations are being ramped back up now. Uh, the U.S. government is taking steps to strengthen uranium mining with plans to set up a uranium reserve and restarting a uranium conversion plant by 2022. Now, the U.S. government has also uh, initiated plans to fund develop, development of rare earths. Uh, in April, the Department of Defense awarded Phase I funding for two projects, the Mountain Pass California project and one in Texas being developed by a joint venture between Australian firm Linus and U.S. firm Blue Line. Now, we're tracking 29 projects in the U.S. and Canada for rare earth mining and production. Um, there's also a lot of development worldwide for rare earth production as a critical mineral. Um, China uh, has more than 60% of the production capacity for rare earths. And um, the Russian government, for example, recently announced plans to spend a, a billion and a half dollars to build out 11 projects for rare earth production. And we're tracking about 13 million worldwide in that market. Thanks for the summary, Joe. Now we're going to be turning and heading south uh, and looking at uh, the trends and the spending levels in Latin America. Now, obviously, a set of economies, Joe, that really has a, a very big dependency on mined commodities. And um, unfortunately, markets which were already showing you know, fairly high degrees of economic, financial and fiscal stress. Um, and just recently, as we could see from the IMF, uh, you know, regional GDP has gone from 
you know, uh, 1.8% in 2019 to around minus 9.4% for this year. So some fairly, fairly major impacts there. So how has the additional pressure from COVID impacted the mining sector across the region? Yeah, several companies, uh, countries have been hit hard by the, by the pandemic. Uh, Brazil, for example, has shuttered uh, a large portion of iron ore capacity, and this has caused uh, prices to rise at a time when uh, demand is increasing in China. Uh, recent tailings disasters like uh, the Bur Bermudino uh, uh, is causing uh, in increased uh, scrutinization of, of the mining process. Uh, recently, the International Council on Mining and Metals released a global standard for tailings management. Uh, there's a lot of work going into dry tailings uh, and alternate tailings, tailings disposal and storage. Uh, new technologies are being tested at both existing and planned mines. For example, F.L. Smith uh, has a technology called EchoTails, where they combine dry tailings and waste rock, and they're testing this out at a project in Mexico called at the Penasquito Mine. And overall, we're tracking about $6 billion worth of tailings-related projects at mines worldwide. Uh, in Chile, uh, Codelco has started the process to restart copper projects and mines that were shuttered during the pandemic. Uh, the company is in the middle of a $40 billion 10-year upgrade and uh, will resume work at El Teniente and Chuchicamata mines um, in Chile. There's a lot of geopolitical issues in South America, uh, social issues um, continue to strain um, development in many countries, um, including Chile, Peru, and Venezuela. Uh, Argentina is in an economic crisis right now. The Argentinian peso keeps falling further against the U.S. dollar. Uh, mining investments are paralyzed due to uncertainty and the lack of uh, clear mining policies in that country. Uh, the lithium industry, which shows a lot of promise, is still waiting to take off. Um, do a Due to a fall in global demand, many companies have decided to postpone investments. Um, there's a lot of lithium production in Chile, Peru, and, and Argentina. Um, in Mexico, uh, mining sector has suffered a recession last year due to mining uh, policies imposed by the new government. Um, they've uh, issued strict quarantine uh, mandates and uh, mining companies were forced to shut down their operations. And this is delaying uh, project spending. Now, moving uh, into what is our final um, market region, Oceana, uh, they've obviously got a very big dependency on how well China performs uh, and certainly cons consumes commodities. So has there been any disruption to production disruption to exports, and certainly disruption to spending levels seen over the last six months. We've already seen China uh, hem back some of their consumption uh, as they cut back on their manufacturing sector, they cut back on their civil infrastructure uh, build out. Uh, and then again, now we've got the COVID uh, issue. So um, how's Oceania, more particularly, how's Australia doing? Yeah, Australia, uh, remoteness is, is definitely paying off for it as it's been relatively unscathed by the pandemic. Um, however, like other export rich nations, it's feeling the economic impact of the, of, of the COVID, uh, such as slowing demand from, for coal from its trading partners. Um, Australia's coal miners are struggling with coast coal sales and lower profit. Uh, coal prices have fallen sharply. Uh, the majority of coal miners have either reduced scope of work uh, during maintenance shutdowns or delayed uh, the shutdowns. Uh, for example, uh, BHP Billiton Mitsubishi Alliance has rescheduled most of its major dragline maintenance, um, and Coronado Coal has reduced uh, its capex by 40% this year. 
In contrast, uh, Australia's iron ore miners are continuing to expand to meet growing demand from Asia. Uh, major Australian iron ore miners, uh, BHP, Rio Tinto, and Fortescue, are benefiting from surging iron ore prices and supply holdups in Brazil. Uh, China currently imports almost 70% of its iron ore from Australia. And as part of its economic stimulus, the Chinese government is spending big in infrastructure upgrade and steel production continues to grow in that country. Um, in New Zealand, most mines uh, have returned to no normal operations. Rio Tinto recently uh, announced that it was going to wind down its uh, aluminum smelter operations there and eventually close by 2021. This is mainly due to high energy costs and challenging outlook for the aluminum industry. Uh, Oceana Gold is uh, expanding and plans to spend about a half billion dollars on CapEx uh, in New Zealand. Thanks, Joe. Now, uh, we're going to move into some of our commodities um, and we're going to be turning to uh, coal. Um, there's obviously a longer term headwind that coal miners are facing, uh, obviously from, as you've referenced a few times, that general decarbonisation of the energy markets and in particular that transition uh, that we're seeing really across most, but not all, geographies by the uh, power generation sector moving away from coal. Now, have this year, have, have coal prices trended um, well? Have they weakened? Uh, and how are mining companies responding to the current demand outlook for coal? Yeah, there's definitely a decrease in demand. Um, companies like Glencore have announced coal production cutbacks in Australia, and this is placing downward pressure on CapEx um, in this sector. Uh, BHP Billiton recently announced plans to sell its coal assets and financing for coal uh, projects is dwindling due to its image as a major polluter and investments are turning greener going forward. Uh, still, that being said, the coal accounts for 27% of the global electricity production and growth is still occurring in China and some Southeast Asian countries while usage is declining in US and Europe. Uh, Germany is phasing out coal and, and nuclear as well. Um, Indian company Adani is moving ahead with construction of its Carmichael coal mine in Australia, which is a big uh, $16 billion investment. Um, in the US, power consumption is down this year, 6% in some areas because of the pandemic. And this is impacting coal demand, which is already losing market share to other fuels. And coal-fired power plants continue to close at, at increasing rates. Uh, Peabody Energy just wrote down the world's largest coal mine, North Antelope Rochelle Mine in Wyoming, for $1.42 billion. U.S. coal miners are um, laying off at some mines. Um, the low steel mill utilization is also impacting uh, demand for med coal, um, although we are seeing some promising med coal export projects in Western Canada. Now, uh, shifting into, uh, into copper, uh, Dr. Copper, seen by many analysts as the, you know, I guess the bellwether for economic health or, or indeed in ill health, this is obviously one of those commodities when, when we were talking a little earlier in the discussion that we were expecting to see this year uh, some degree of supply constraints of you know, fairly rapid, I think, or, or, or accelerated demand growth. Certainly that growth, the rates of growth exceeding the rate of new supply coming online. So um, would you say at this point of the year that that supply um, constraint may actually still play out or do you think now you know we're back into an imbalanced market yeah i think it's uh, interesting uh, copper price has recovered uh, a bit since low hitting lows in march and this is mainly driven by recovery in demand from china um, the supply constraints from major producing countries like peru and federal stimulus programs are also helping 
in Chile, Codelco actually increased production during the pandemic, uh, possibly to the detriment of its workers, which are experiencing high numbers of infection. In Peru, uh, pandemic shutdowns and social unrest are leading to production curtailment, and some strikes are occurring at some mines. Uh, CITIC has declared force majeure and its La Bamba's mine concentrate shipments after mining protesters set fire to trucks there. Um, and then the U.S., uh, SARCO is restarting operations at mines and smelters after a, a nine-month labor strike. So there's been a lot of supplied uh, issues recently with copper. Mm -hmm. Right, we're going to move on to the other side of that sort of steel coin. We've talked about coal and now we're going to be looking at uh, iron ore. Um, obviously a commodity whose outlook is, is, as I've said, you know, very closely twinned to that of steel, which, and as we know, the steel, the steel markets have been, certainly over the last few years, have been impacted by a state of, I guess, major oversupply globally, uh, and was certainly one of the key initiators of that uh, you know, the US-China trade war, and then obviously the subsequent tip that, that trade uh, tariffs that, that then invariably ensued. How does the demand outlook for iron ore currently look at present? Yeah, iron ore demand has recovered uh, nicely, especially in China, where infrastructure stimulus is keeping steel mills busy. Um, steel makers in China are in the midst of a massive relocation and a replacement program where complete steel mills are being built anew in coastal areas and with new technology, improving emissions and uh, reduction of capacity uh, all happening at the same time. The Chinese steel makers are planning $153 billion worth of projects accounting for about 45 billion, sorry, 45 percent of the value of the world's steel projects. That's an enormous amount of, of activity. Uh, China's steel exports are down 25% year over year in July, perhaps a benefit to US trade, uh, of US trade tariffs. Iron ore imports hit record highs in recent months uh, into China, boosting prices and making uh, Australian exporters like Rio Tinto very happy. Um, in Brazil, uh, Vale, which has had significant amount of production curtailed for iron ore due to sa safety closures um, stemming from uh, the mine disaster issues. And now COVID uh, just last week approved a $1.5 billion expansion of the Sarasul mine, which would increase capacity of that mine from 90 million tons up to 120 million tons per year. Um, in the US, uh, the steel industry is improving um, capacity utilization has risen from a, to about 60% from a low of 51% in May, so very low utilization rates remain. Um, U.S. and ArcelorMittal uh, are restarting some blast furnaces, which were temporarily idled earlier in the year. Um, that's mainly in response to the automotive industry uh, opening up factories again. Uh, U.S. Steel has said that uh, two of its blast furnaces will remain shuttered until at least through the end of the year. Okay, now we're going to move to our last set of commodities um, and some of those precious metals. I guess the flight to safety by investors over the last, you know, over the course of much of this year has helped obviously support Gold prices, which I think you know, have touched, touched a historic high very, very recently. Um, but my big question is: is really, do these higher prices will they result or stimulate or incentivize mining companies to actually invest more capex, or will it be a case of just banking the cash and, and, and uh, you know, uh, using that cash for other things off these? Uh, higher prices that we've seen uh, over the last few months. Yeah, well, it seems like gold is always busy from a mining standpoint. Um, of course, recently the uh, historic high price of, of gold over $2,000 per ounce 
Um, and that's doubled. The price of gold has doubled since the bottom of the market in late 2016. So this is definitely driving development of gold mining projects around the world. Uh, and as a result, uh, there's significant development on grassroots mine projects as well as life extension projects and new underground uh, development. Great, thanks, Joe. Now, Joe, that uh, actually brings us to the conclusion of, of, of the formal part of the presentation. But before we, we kind of let you off the hook, I would like you to stick around and answer a few questions that have come in from uh, today's attendees. Uh, but before we get into some of those questions, can you give us your sort of 30 second summary of what we should expect to see over the next 18 months and what we should be keeping an eye on? Yeah, I think there's definitely reason to be optimistic for next year, as all indications point to a rebound. Um, mining companies continue to reinvest themselves um, and into assets and in order to keep up with the world's changing commodity appetite and sustainability targets. So this is driving a lot of innovation and new processing technologies, automation and emissions reduction. Okay. So, Joe, we're going to move into some of the questions that have come in, and um, we typically um, always talk about the big capex and what, what's happening with capex. Can I get some of your thoughts and perspectives on how the maintenance market is playing out? Bearing in mind also that's probably been impacted to some degree from you know mines being shuttered, um, but obviously equipment which is working very very hard every single day needs to be you know maintained enough uh, you know and looked after so uh, can you just give us some sort of top line views on on how the uh, you know the maintenance spending market is playing out yeah i think the biggest impact from from the pandemic is it's changing maintenance programs so they're either moving up to take place during the shutdown or they're being pushed out and in general, the companies are spending less money on on maintenance uh, as they're trying to cons conserve cash during this period. Now, the operating costs are, are continued to rise at mines. Um, you know, if you look at uh, uh, gold mining, for example, the price has gone from uh, 250 to 300 dollars an ounce cost in the 1990s to nowadays in the upper 700s uh, mine costs. So the, the cost is definitely, uh, the operating cost is definitely going up mm. and the companies okay. have to have to deal with that. Now, I want to sort of shift gear a little bit and another question's come in really around, I guess it's some of these um, uh, you know, new economies. So, you know, in particular, what is the outlook for some of those uh, energy-related uh, metals and, and, and minerals? You know, the lithiums, the cobalt. How is that sort of mining activity playing out? Are we seeing a big surge in new grassroots development um, because of the reciprocal growth in electric vehicles and battery storage technologies? Well, we're definitely seeing. Uh, more project development and the early stages exploration and uh, planning stages. Uh, because of the price of lithium has dropped a bit recently and demand is, is waning, the companies that have been expanding are going to finish their expansions and then put off maybe the, the further phases of expansion that we're, we're looking at until demand rebounds. So that's kind of what we're seeing for the battery metals right now. Um, yeah. So I've got another question just, that's just come in, and I guess this relates back to the OPEX cost that you're saying is, is increasing, you know, across most operational mines. And, and you know, you referenced a little earlier in the, in the discussion this shift towards uh, investing more in automation in, at the mine site, and that automation is coming, you know, from tele-remote operations, AHS, ADS. Can you just sort of touch on some of the, 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 the types of spending that you're seeing? And do you see this as, uh, you know, something that's uh, going to be sustainable long term? Well, we're seeing a lot of spending in automation of mining equipment, either uh, battery 
uh, uh, haul trucks or underground uh, um, fuel cell. There's a lot of development in hydrogen fuel cells as well. So this is driving a lot of R&D and development um, to this is all part of the decarbonization trend where companies are trying to reduce their carbon footprint. So one way to do that is to reduce diesel usage. So they're looking at these new um, technologies. So I guess that's driven, some of that automation is driven really by, you know, the environmental uh, responsibility. But I can assume also that, you know, you referenced a few times that there was some mines shuttered. Uh, there was one mine I think you re referenced that, you know, they kept production going and, and that had a reciprocal impact on infection rates. Do you think that COVID may actually be, uh, in a funny way, a, a positive enabler or driver of more um, automation controls or automation spending? Do you think that could be a, a kind of a, a positive upside of what we're seeing at the moment? Well, I def definitely think it uh, speeds up that, that process. So uh, companies are definitely looking to improve safety at, at the mines. Uh, and that all plays in with the automation as well. It also reduces costs for labor and, and energy when you automate systems. So it's definitely an important. And COVID has just kind of highlighted that. Um, and the, these companies are all having to reinvent themselves and, and how to deal with the COVID issue and also the changing economic uh, demand for commodities. Okay. Now, I, another final question. I think I'm very conscious of time and I, I'd love to keep chatting uh, much longer. But um, one question is, and, I, and this is really a, could be an explanation around the type of projects that we're also tracking. Um, what is your view, the proportions, the, 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 the balance of spend, I guess, between you know, deep shaft projects that are in the planning or construction, say, versus open pit or surface mining? Uh, that is certainly something that we track. We track both. Um, what's the, 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 the kind of trends there? Are we seeing one being growing versus the other, or is it very much just on a mine-by-mine mine mine basis? Well, the overall trend is that mines are going deeper, and, and uh, so there's more underground mines being developed. Uh, the surface mines, you know, the easy-to-get-to um, reserves uh, are being develop first and and then they're going deeper so we're definitely seeing uh, more access and we do keep track of that so we can provide uh, you know a breakdown of underground versus uh, open pit uh, mining for for clients great thanks Joe um, I know I think we probably sort of jumped over our uh, our a lot of time uh, I very much enjoyed the discussion so a big thanks to you uh, for sharing Thanks, not only your time, but also, you know, your thoughts and views and perspectives on the market. I found that very useful. Thank you. Uh, and obviously, uh, a very big thanks to our webinar sponsors as well, folks over at Hexagon. Many thanks for your support today. Very much appreciated. Um, folks who are still on the call, uh, don't forget you can replay this presentation so you can hear it again. And indeed, if you log into our portal, into our website, you can uh, hear some of the uh, his, you know, previous webinars that we've conducted. Um, looking forward, if you do get a chance, please join us for our next Industry Outlook, where we're going to be talking with our VP of North American Industrial Manufacturing, and that's going to happen on, I think, the 9th of September. Um, so if you're still on the call, just hang on for a few more seconds. Uh, don't pop off yet. Um, as I switch this off, you're going to be hit with a, a very short poll. We just appreciate your feedback, whether this has been valuable or not, and if there's anything else you'd like us to change going forward. So uh, with that, Joe, thank you. Folks over at Hexagon, thank you. Uh, and those folks who've attended, big thanks to you. Okay. Goodbye. <laughs>